Hello, good afternoon. So, uh, topic five today. Uh, I have actually lots of things to talk to you about today, and uh, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the exam that's next week, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the lab and uh, finish topic five, hopefully, and uh, maybe start, start topic six. So, pretty ambitious today. So, let's see where we get. Just finish letting all these people into the class and we're going to get started. All right, so first let's talk about that midterm. So the midterm is one week away and um, I meant to this afternoon but forgot to do it. I was going to post some review slides. Uh, I have a review session planned. It will be next Wednesday. Uh, the entire class will be a review session. Um, but I do want to say a few things about it now, just to get you started so that you can uh, get, get going on your studying. So the exam is going to be 35 marks and you'll have an hour to do it. It's going to be on Moodle using the lockdown browser. I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, you can see the format there. That's the planned format. It'll be about uh, 10 to 15 questions will be um, multiple choice, true, false. Uh, five questions will be short answer. So short answer could be anything from define something or uh, could be fill in the blank style or uh, explain what, uh, let's say a bacterial flagella does or, you know, something like that. So there'll be, there'll be five of those questions worth one mark each. And uh, like I've been telling you in the, uh, in the lectures, when uh, you have one mark, uh, I'm assuming that's one kind of complete thought. So that's about one or two sentences. You don't have to write in sentence form, uh, but uh, just in terms of, you know, get away from one word answers and those kind of things, right? Because uh, you want the full mark and, uh, you know, some people end up uh, not doing so well because they're getting all these half marks and, you know, it adds up or adds down or whatever way you want to look at it. I'll have uh, one or two matching questions on there. Uh, and then uh, a couple of long answer questions on there as well. And the long answer questions will be worth five marks each. So I've given you some examples of those as we've gone along, for example, comparing different types of microscopy or something like that. So I haven't written the test yet, so I haven't uh, fully uh, decided that this is exactly what it would be like. Um, sometimes in the end, when I'm done writing the test, I have like, you know, let's say I have 11 multiple choice. And, and so maybe I'll have one less short answer, but it'd be very, very close to this. Uh, just so you have an idea of what it looks like. So the sample midterm that I posted uh, is, is, is uh, uh, follows this format, it's 35 marks. So you can take a look at that to get an idea of what the flavor of my midterms look like. The um, sample uh, quiz that I have on there that has, uh, I think it has 70 multiple choice questions. Uh, those are just uh, directly from the uh, test bank from the textbook. And uh, so like I said, some of those may maybe have, there might be a little bit in there that, of things we didn't talk about, um, but, uh, but my questions will all focus on the lectures uh, and, the, and the material that we've covered. So do study your notes, uh, make sure you know the detail, details. Uh, we've covered a lot more than probably you've anticipated. And if you're not familiar with some of those words that we've talked about, you know, probably learning 10, 20 new words a lecture, it's really important that you, that you do go through the vocabulary, you know, know the difference between hydrophobic and hydrophilic, you know uh, what amphipathic means, uh, you know, what is a triacylglyceride? So all of those things are important to know. So let's talk about that lockdown browser. Um, probably some of you have used it before in the fall semester. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I want you to tell, a little, tell you a little bit about what it is. Uh, it is a, a system where you have to download uh, this lockdown browser thing. And um, what it does is it will monitor you. So what you need to do is basically treat this as an in-person exam. And uh, you're gonna log in. And uh, you, you basically log in through Moodle, uh, go through your usual browser. And when you click start, it'll, uh, if you don't have the lockdown browser on your computer, it'll ask you to download it. And um, what it's going to do is uh, basically monitor you for, through your webcam and microphone, so you need to make sure your webcam and your microphone are available. And uh, what it's going to do, it's programmed in such a way that it can um, it can flag suspicious behavior. So if it hears talking or if your face is not visible and things like that, it gives me flags. And when I have flags, I I review your case and and uh, 
uh, you know, to basically watch for, for cheating and whatnot. Um, so I do have a sample test uh, that I'm putting together. I can't remember if I put it up or not. Uh, if not, I'll make sure it's available directly after class. It's just a one question uh, test so that you can log in and try the lockdown browser. Um, everybody has their own unique kind of uh, technologies. You know, there's, there's different laptops out there and some people are worried about their Wi-Fi and whatnot. So I want you to do the sample test and uh, I'm gonna assume that everyone has done the sample test before next Friday. Uh, I'll probably check on Wednesday to see who has and has not done it. And uh, if, if you haven't done it, I'll send you a message to remind you to do it because I want you to make sure this works on your computer so that we don't have any issues. Uh, if you do have issues, you need to email me right away or uh, phone me right away. I'm going to, uh, I haven't decided whether I'll be in my office or not, but I'll probably maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be in my office next Friday. So you can call my office number and you can call me there. Uh, and, uh, and so we can work out any other bugs. If you do have some concerns about trying to get this thing to work, um, I, I, can, I can possibly arrange for you to come to campus to write. Um, you know, you can bring your laptop there and you can sit in the classroom with me or something like that. Um, but like I said, try the sample test. I'll have it up today. If I don't have it up there already, I just can't remember whether I made it visible to you or not. And, um, and hopefully we can, we can work through this. Like I said, if you're familiar with this, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. So uh, what have we covered? Uh, we've covered so far topics one, two, 20, three, four, and we're working our way through five. Uh, my plan was to get through topic six, uh, and I'm not sure where I'm gonna be until the end of Monday's lecture. So during Monday's lecture, I might say, okay, this is where the midterm is up to. So it may or may not cover all of topic six. I will decide that on Monday. Uh, kind of just depends on where we get with everything. So, uh, I want to say a couple of things about studying. Uh, and uh, I know I talked about it a little bit before, way back when we were, uh, had our first class, I was talking a little bit about studying and, and this is just a joke, by the way, I found this on the internet. You can see the act of texting, eating and watching TV with an open textbook nearby. So what I want to do for right now, is just give you a few ideas about how to approach studying uh, for this course in particular. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, the lectures are essential information for this. So what does this mean? It means you need to start off with the lecture notes. And by lecture notes, I don't just mean the ones that I've put up on Moodle, but any notes that you've taken uh, during class time. And uh, go through those notes and, uh, you know, write on them. And if you see things you don't know what they are, you're, you're going to look them up. And, and if there's any gaps in your knowledge, you know, use your textbook, the internet, uh, uh, talk to me during my office hours and, and kind of flesh out that information. In particular, I would like you to review the study questions and the vocabulary words. Uh, the study questions and vocabulary words, they are not exam questions, but when I make my exams, that's often where I start. I look there and say, okay, how can I make a question on this? So you see that the study questions are usually a little bit more open-ended. Like, I think I have one study question that says, what is equal I? Uh, I'm not going to ask you that on a test. That's, uh, I, that's probably a huge essay kind of question. But I might ask you something specific about E. coli. Like I could make a multiple choice question around E. coli that says, where is E. coli found? And the answer to that, of course, is that it's found in, um, in your intestine. It's also found in the intestine of other mammals and birds. So, you know, that, there could be a multiple choice question around that, right? Uh, so do take a look there at those study questions and, and vocabulary words and, uh, and go through them. And uh, try to understand them because, like I said, that's where I'm going to focus when I'm, I'm starting to write out the test. I'm going to talk about making your notes in a minute. And like I said, you can contact me at any time uh, and uh, I can try to help you with any questions you might have. So when you're studying, consider what you're doing and what distractions you might have near you. Okay. Um, you know, I, I encourage you to unplug. Put your phone away. Um, you know, I, I had a friend when I was a student and uh, he, he literally, what he did was unplug his computer to study because it would just distract him with his online gaming and stuff. And uh, do what you need to find some quiet and focus. Um, you know, take breaks, get sleep, eat healthy. Uh, sleep is super important. That's how we form memories, by the way. Our brain will actually crystallize memories when we sleep. So it's important you do get some sleep along the way uh, in between your studying and that you take good breaks. Uh, exercise is important too. I know it's, it's hard 
to get out lately since everything's closed and it's cold. But, uh, you know, get up and stretch and do uh, some yoga or something. So I showed you this, uh, this video uh, way back at the beginning. I wanted to replay it for you. It's, it's really short, but it, it talks about, uh, you know, a pretty good approach to studying biology. So I'm going to play this for you right now. I think I might just have to make sure I have the sound shared. Okay, we'll try that. So I'll replay this for you. And like I said, it gives you some good ideas about how I think is, uh, is an excellent approach to studying biology. So here goes. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So you can see it's just saying, you know, you, putting in the effort is what's going to pay off. And um, I'm really huge believer in note taking. And the reason why I believe note taking is important because what you're doing is organizing things, you're forming memories, and, uh, and, and putting that structure in your mind. Uh, here's an example, by the way, of um, this was a student from a couple of years ago, and uh, he was showing me his study and practice. And I thought it was really good and kind of followed what that video was talking about. And, what he was trying to do is put every unit on one page. So you can see this is uh, topic one, I think. And uh, you can see he was uh, sort of trying to condense everything on one page. And so then in the end, for the midterm, he literally had only six pages to study. Um, so there's lots of different approaches to this. I know some people like to use recipe cards. And I know one student, uh, she was showing me, she actually made a big poster, uh, you know, these mind map things. I don't know a lot about mind maps. Uh, you know, it's with all these arrows and flow charts and things going on. And, 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 you know, like talk to your friends, find out what they do. Different people try different things. So this is why I'm trying to show you some examples of things that you can do. Um, but uh, in, in the end, the reality is uh, just tuning into the discovery channel is probably not going to do it for you. And if you want to do well, it's important to know the material uh, really well. Um, the video did say read the textbook. I love it when people read textbooks. That's great. Um, but I want you to focus on my notes because that's where the focus is going to be. I'm not going to be picking up obscure things from the textbook we didn't cover. Um, so my notes are the most important thing, and that's what I'm looking at when I actually make the test. So let me know if you have any questions uh, as you study. And like I said, uh, Wednesday's class, the entire class will be a review session. And uh, hopefully by then people have studied a bit. And, uh, and if you have any questions or concepts in particular before Wednesday, uh, please come to Wednesday's class with those questions so that uh, I can I can help you better. Review sessions, uh, you know, for me are a lot less interesting than the rest of the semester because I feel like I'm saying the same thing to the same people. Um, but I don't always necessarily know, uh, you know, from semester to semester uh, where, uh, you know, people are finding things a little fuzzy. So it's important, like I said, if you come with questions, all the better. So 
that is all I have to say for the midterm at the moment. I am going to put up uh, this, this PowerPoint. I don't have it posted yet. I meant to do that this afternoon, uh, but it's going to be the review PowerPoint and some of the things that we're going to talk about on Wednesday. Uh, I'll, I'll post that up. Um, I'll try to do that this evening and, and get that in there and it'll have this information. In it. So um, just watch for that if you haven't done so already. Okay, so I want to spend a minute or two talking about the labs now as well. So uh, I think uh, most people have handed in uh, the Lab 1, 2 report, so that's great. Uh, so that is, uh, was due yesterday. Um, if you're one of the people who has not handed it in, please get it in immediately, um, or I may have to start deducting late marks. Um, so uh, I will try to have that graded uh, soon. Um, and uh, uh, the good news is the next report isn't due now for three weeks, so February 25th. Uh, the bad news is it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be this formal report. So what I'm going to do uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, I'm going to spend about two to three minutes at the beginning of every class uh, basically going over this formal lab report. It's worth about 14% of your grade. So that's huge, right? That's almost as much as a midterm. Midterms are 15%, by the way. And uh, you're not going to be able to do a good job if you try to do this whole thing all week. So, you, so I encourage you to, you know, work a little bit on it, you know, over several evenings. So in lectures, what I'm going to do is um, um, today just a tiny bit, but basically uh, uh, spend a little bit of time, uh, you know, so on Monday, for example, talk about maybe the title and introduction and you know and then the day after that I'll talk a little bit about the methods and the results and so on and so each day I give you some tips uh, if, I, if I tell you all at once you're just going to go and forget it all anyway so do take a look at uh, I, I gave you a two-page kind of uh, tip sheet uh, with lab three and if you look at appendix a as, as well appendix a is like 15 pages and it talks about all these things in tons of detail so refer back to those things as you, as you do your writing as well and uh, if you're going to do a Bachelor of Science, you're going to have to do a lot of these things. Uh, I had one semester where I had to do 12 of these in one semester. And uh, it was a lot of writing, but by the end of that, uh, you know, they, they weren't so bad. You just, you just get used to it. Um, but if it's your first time, uh, it's going to be a lot of work. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of uh, little particular things that you're going to have, to have to think about that maybe you're not necessarily used to thinking. So to give you an idea how big this is going to be, it's going to be, most students, it's going to be five to six pages of actual written stuff, so double spaced, so that may not seem too bad, um, but it is technical writing, so it takes a little bit of thought. And then with your graphs, you're going to have three graphs, you're going to have some rough data uh, and some calculations and, and whatnot. And so most people are going to hand in about somewhere around 10-ish pages, um, maybe a little bit more if you're, if you're long-winded uh, of, of actual work. Um, so it, it's going to be a little bit of work on this. So do take a look as well at, of course, the, the grading scheme here. And this kind of, you can use this as sort of a checklist for each of the sections to make sure that you have everything that you need. So I do want to just talk about for a minute about graphing. I'm hoping people have at least uh, attempted to make the graphs for lab three. So there's three graphs that you have to make for lab three. And uh, so the standard curve, the temperature part of the test, and the solvent part of the test. And uh, so if you, if, you, if you go all the way to the end of the lab video, I do have a Microsoft Excel tutorial that can help you with graphing. You don't have to do your graphing on Microsoft Excel. Uh, you can do it on another software or you can do it on graph paper. Um, but I do want to give you some tips on things to make sure that you're doing with your graphing. Okay, so if you take a look, here's a graph, uh, just kind of some random numbers I threw in there. So first thing to know is that make sure you have nice defined data points. Uh, I don't want little dots. I want nice big data points. You don't have to use a diamond. You can use a triangle, square, whatever. Um, number two, make sure you have the correct units. So I want to point this one out in particular. So that is micro moles per liter, right? So micro is a metric. It means 10 to the minus six. And the big M means moles per liter. So make sure you have a big M. For some reason in this lab, uh, some people like to use a little m. And a little m means meters. We're not measuring meters. We're measuring moles per liter. So make sure you use that. If you don't want to use the big M, write moles per liter. That's, that's perfectly acceptable as well. So make sure your title goes below it. So all graphs are figures. Okay? 
uh, and so your title goes below. If this were a table, the figure or the, the title would go above. Uh, why is that? Uh, I'm not sure. That's just what most people do in biology, uh, um, in bio biology publications. So it's because everyone does it, it's called a convention, and we have to learn how to do it too. Um, so make sure that your title has a number. So you can see this one here, I've got a number, it could be one, two, three, A, B, C, or in this case, it's lab three, and it's the second one, so I call it three dash two. So make sure it has some sort of uh, logical sequence. Uh, your title is gonna be descriptive, and I'll talk about titles next day uh, a bit more, but uh, think about all the things that, that we did in this, in this particular experiment. So you should talk about um, the organism, and that organism is gonna have a name. You're gonna use the binomial Latin name, and that will be in italics. Uh, you better talk about membranes. This was a experiment testing, you know, the effect of temperature on membranes. So you should say something about that. Okay, don't just say concentration versus temperature or something like that. Uh, that's really kind of lame. Uh, it's not a title. That's just reading to me what the axis is. That's not a title. I can read what the axes are. The title should describe the experiment. You can do it in one or two sentences or three if you have to. Uh, it doesn't really matter. So I'll come back and talk more about titles. Uh, that's probably one of the things I'll talk about on Monday. So that's it for labs for now. I know you have the midterm to worry about, but uh, I do uh, uh, encourage you to, you know, take a look at it here and there. And if you have anything you want me to look at, um, rough drafts or, or whatnot, uh, the, the more you do it ahead of time, the better this whole thing is going to be. It gives you a lot more time to polish and, and fix things up as you go along. Okay, I think that's enough. I just blew 20 minutes. So let's talk about prokaryotes. So back to uh, mostly referring to bacteria. So last day, we were talking about the bacterial flagella. And uh, so flagella is many, flagellum is one. So you can see that word flagellum on this slide. And uh, I showed you a video or two and I think I defined it. So I'll go back to that. Uh, uh, the, those notes that we were writing the definitions on uh, in a couple of minutes here. So this is what a flagellum looks like. Uh, you can see it's anchored into the membrane and cell wall. And so this particular diagram is showing the gram negative. There's two membranes and uh, it's anchored in there. You can think of that anchor as uh, kind of like a tiny, tiny, tiny molecular motor. And what that motor does is it spins. And so as a consequence, this entire flagella it basically rotates. And that's how they get along, around. Uh, it rotates clockwise and counterclockwise. And uh, so I'll show you uh, some videos in a minute of, of this motion in action. But it's kind of, you can think of it as like a, a boat propeller or a prop, it's just spinning around and, and allowing it to go through uh, you know, its environment. So by the way, don't worry about the eukaryotic flagellum yet. We are gonna talk about this uh, after the midterm. But uh, I just want to make a quick note and say, we're going to talk about it. There are flagella in eukaryotes. But the big thing to know about them is that they're actually very different structures. These things don't rotate. They kind of flip back and forth like whips or tails. Uh, so we're going to talk more about these things, um, like I said, after the midterm. Just the prokaryotic flagella today. So they come in, uh, in, in different arrangements. Some of these organisms have one, some of them have many. Uh, I don't know if there's any advantages or disadvantages to them. You can't usually see them under a light microscope. You need these special stains. These uh, they're kind of these thick stains that, that make the structure fatter, and then and then you can see it. And you, there's some there's some images anyway of some stained uh, flagella. So here are some videos. You can see that one on the left. This is a really cool video. Uh, some sort of fluorescence microscopy, and you can actually see the rotation of of a little flagella. So very cool. The second video here, uh, you can sort of see they, they, they zigzag around. And so what they do is they actually spin counterclockwise for a while and that allows them to swim straight. And then they spin counterclockwise and that allows them to change direction. So they kind of zigzag. And if they're going in the right direction, let's say towards food, they'll swim longer. If they're going away from food, they swim short and then change direction. That's kind of how they move around. I'll show you this last video here. These ones are tethered, which means they're attached to a glass slide. And uh, so they're not moving, but you can see the actual cells rotating. So some pretty cool videos. So one more thing to say about flagella is that there are some organisms that have an endoflagella. Uh, 
this is kind of weird in some ways, but uh, uh, very interesting. And the flagellum itself is actually in the periplasm. So remember what the periplasm is, it's that, it's that region between the two membranes in a gram negative. And uh, these organisms um, are, uh, are spiral shaped organisms. We call those spirochetes. You can see that word there, spirochete. And uh, so rather than the flagellum just rotating, the entire organism rotates. So you can see this video, the kind of corkscrew through. So this organism here, Borrelia, this is the one that causes Lyme disease. And uh, it can actually burrow through several tissues. So initially when you get it, it's not normally a rash and maybe some, some aches in your, in your joints. Uh, but in, in some, if you don't get treated, uh, it can eventually get to all sorts of other tissues and cause like um, damage and heart palpitations and things, which is why Lyme disease can be dangerous if, if untreated. All right, so I showed you this slide before. I told you, you know, you were learning some F words last day. So last day, so today we were talking about the flagellum. So this is for swimming or motility is the technical term. And last day we also talked about fimbria or pili, and those are like little sticky hairs, and they're allowing this thing to attach to surfaces. All right, so there's a few other bacterial structures that I want to talk about and uh, that are important to know. And the uh, first one are these things here called glycocalyx. So I don't like this word, it's kind of hard to say, but remember glyco means sugar or carbohydrate. And calyx actually means layer or coat. So a glycocalyx is just a sugar coat. And uh, there's, there's kind of two different kinds. And, and this is one of these things that uh, if you study the organism, you're going to name it. Um, but generally, a capsule is kind of uh, uh, more neatly organized. And a slime layer is more loose. Uh, both of them are kind of sticky substances. So these carbohydrates, what are they doing? Uh, these carbohydrates, they, uh, they absorb water. So maybe I'll write that down, absorb water. And so what does that do? So this makes the organisms uh, both sticky and slippery. Sticky and slippery. So why is that important? Well, this is just another way for them to attach to surfaces. I'll show you a picture here of one, and this one here is apparently attached to a tonsil cell. So this one here, by the way, is a streptococcus, and you may have heard of strep throat. And so this is the organism that is causing strep throat. It's uh, sticking to somebody's tonsil and, uh, and making them sick. And if it doesn't have the capsule, it can't make you sick. So this is kind of, this is pretty important for pathogenesis. Uh, another reason why these structures are important is because they're, they're slippery as well. And uh, so picture slime, right? It's sticky and slippery at the same time, right? And uh, th this makes it harder for immune cells to grab onto them and attach them. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm just going to go back to our notes. So remember, we we're making these notes here. And uh, we uh, were talking about bacterial structures. So just coming back here and we talked about flagella. So now I want to um, I'm add glycocalyx. I've got to be able to spell it right. There we go, glycocalyx. So, Maybe I will put that there were two types. So we had capsules, which are the sort of more organized ones. And we have slime layers. There we go. So what are these things made out of? They're made of carbohydrates. I mean, you could say carbohydrates and water if you want. But really, they're carbohydrates mostly. I'm just assuming there's water because it's a biological thing. So what do these things do? These allow them to stick to services. They also allow for the evasion of immune cells. So that means escape. And uh, that's because they're slippery. And uh, the immune cells have a hard time grabbing onto that and, and destroying them by phagocytosis. All right, so uh, back to the PowerPoint. And let's talk about a couple other things. Um, you just spend a little bit more time talking about biofilms, but I'm, I'm going to mostly skip over this for now. But uh, one thing to know is sometimes you may have heard this term biofilm. And uh, um, in, in the wild, uh, bacteria, they often live in these things called biofilms. So what is a biofilm? It's, it's kind of like slime. And uh, it's uh, secretions by these organisms. And, 
And uh, so this slime is going to contain um, often those capsules and slime layers, and it may contain other things that they, they secrete to allow them to live in that environment. So maybe other glycoproteins and whatnot. And uh, so anything that's slimy out there, you could imagine, right? If you've gone swimming and uh, you're on a, a rock and the rock has slime on it, that's, that's probably a biofilm of some sort. Uh, there are a lot of biofilms that are medically uh, relevant. So right now on your teeth, uh, even if you brushed recently, you probably still have some biofilm. Maybe if you just went to the dentist, you might be clear. Uh, and, uh, and so what is that? That's the bacteria living on your teeth and they're living there uh, you know, in, in their goo. So if you haven't brushed your teeth recently, uh, you know, they sort of get a little, they feel a little fuzzy or whatever that term is. And, and it's just, it's just the biofilm getting a little thicker. Uh, when that biofilm starts to harden, uh, your dentist will call that plaque. So, uh, you know, and, and if, you, if you don't brush at all, uh, you know, you might get uh, uh, periodontitis, which is inflammation of the, of the gums. And obviously that's, that's not very good. So the question is, right, if you are going to, uh, you know, keep just the brush or just the toothpaste, I would vote for the brush every time. The toothpaste is great, it has fluoride in it, but the brush, the actual mechanical scrubbing that you do, uh, is actually gonna remove those biofilms. You can't remove it without them. So like I said, there's lots of, lots of different types of biofilms. So I um, just wanted to kind of throw that out there. And uh, I'm not gonna put that on the test because um, I just don't feel like I have time to give it, give it a lot of justice this semester. But you may hear about biofilms in other classes. All right, it looks like it's time for a Kahoot. Now, I'm just gonna warn you, there are a couple other bacterial structures, but they're just not on this Kahoot. I thought this would be a good time to um, kind of, you know, get us to refocus and a and, um, little break from all the information. So I'll load this up for you and uh, here we go. So I'll give you a minute to join. So the game pin should be coming up any second. There it is, seven, six, one, Seven nine seven seven. Okay, so let's get started. All right, question one. All these, by the way, are going to uh, ask you, what is that particular object? So let's see if you can remember what object one is. Okay, so the correct answer is the nucleoid. So let's just take a quick look at the image so you can see it is the, uh, the DNA. Remember, there is no nucleus, no membrane-bound nucleus, so the correct answer is the nucleoid. And uh, unfortunately, no, bo no bonus points to ever picked spaghetti, so ha ha ha. All right, number two. So hopefully you can see number two. Number two is that, uh, that little hair-like thing uh, on the cell surface. Okay, so that is a pillus or a fimbriae. Uh, a few people answered flagellum. Flagellum is number four, the big long thing. Hopefully I don't have a question about that because I just gave away the answer, uh, but it is, uh, it is a pillus. All right, question three. Object four. Hmm, what did I just say? Wow, that was fast. All right, good job for listening. Just seeing who's awake. Number five. So this one might be a little bit harder to tell which one it is, but it's kind of that outer uh, coat of something that's on um, on the outside of the cell. 
So the correct answer is glycocalyx. You're right, it is a sugar coat. What was number two? So number two is papillus. Okay, I have a couple more questions for you. Five, or maybe this is the last one. Object six is, and object seven is, oh boy, you have to answer two at the same time. So I'm just looking at this diagram to give you an idea. Just think about what's on the inside and what is, uh, what is uh, directly outside of that. Hopefully that is a good enough clue for you. Okay, so the correct answer is plasma membrane cell wall. So the clue there, like I said, the, the membrane is always on the inside of the cell wall. Cell wall is always outside of it. And since we've already answered that this is the glycocalyx, uh, anything with capsule and slime layer is incorrect. So correct answer, cell membrane and cell wall. By the way, plasma membrane, cell membrane, those words are interchangeable. So hopefully uh, that's clear. Plasma just means it's the membrane surrounding the cytoplasm. So um, it's, it's used probably a little more common than, than cell membrane. Okay, let's see how the score is. So congratulations for Michelle. Okay, and Kristen, well done. And for the sneak win was Levi. Okay. So well done, uh, I think that was one of the better ones. Uh, lots of people getting the right answers, so that's encouraging. Maybe that means you're studying already for the midterm, that's just gonna make me happy, right? Okay, a few more things I wanna talk about in terms of bacterial structures, and I will uh, write some notes on these. Um, one structure that's uh, really important for bacteria and, and unique to certain, certain species, so gram, certain gram positives, are these things called endospores. So what is an endospore? Endo means inside. And, uh, and a spore is kind of like a dormant uh, sleeping structure. So what happens is certain species, so uh, uh, Clostridium is, is a good example of, of an organism that, uh, you know, when, when things dry up or there's not enough nutrients, it goes into a self-preservation mode. And uh, what it does is, like I said, it's kind of like it goes to sleep or, or something like that. But it's a little more complicated than that. I'll show you an image of that in a moment. Uh, but it makes these endospores. So you can see there's some images of them. You can see just inside there, these ones on the right look like little tennis rackets. And the endospore is that tiny little thing in there. The one on the left, endospores uh, are stained in a specific color, so they're kind of all blue. So what is in that endospore? So basically they're protecting their DNA and uh, they're, they're putting a few chemicals and extra ribosomes in there and coating in a super thick layer of peptidoglycan and hoping it will survive and that they can germinate another day. So um, unfortunately, um, endospores have been used for terrorism. And uh, so probably most of you are, are not old enough to remember, but in 2001, there were the terrorist attacks um, with the airplanes. And uh, shortly after that, uh, there were also uh, some um, male terrorism where anthrax endospores were sent through the, uh, the post office and a number of, uh, a number of people got uh, quite sick from these spores. So, so that's really, was really unfortunate event. So here's an endospore here. And like I said, think of it as just, you know, protecting the DNA. Uh, there's chemicals they, they make to um, um, protect it from, from drying out and, uh, and, and just a, an extra thick layer of peptidoglycan, which is called the spore coat. I think I have an image here that shows you how an endospore is formed. So it's a little bit different from normal cell division. It starts to divide, but it really just protects one side. So it, it like I said, loads lots of ribosomes and, and ATP in there so it can be ready to germinate. Sometimes the spore will, uh, will come out. Uh, sometimes it will, will be protected. But think of it as just a protective kind of system and it can, it can remain dormant uh, for a long, long time. So what do I mean by long time? These things are super tough, by the way. And, uh, they can last for years. Uh, there's been numerous studies that show these things can last up to 50 years in some cases. So for example, um, Louis Pasteur, you know, that famous French scientist in the 1880s, uh, you know, after he died, 67 years later, they, they pulled out a box of his junk and they found some endospores in there and they were able to revive bacteria from it by just adding a little food and water. 
Uh, so lots of studies like this show that they can last up to 50 years uh, in some cases. Um, these other studies uh, were, were, were kind of like the science. There's a little bit of debate around this, but, uh, but definitely there's been scientists that have um, uh, published on this, that they have revived endospores from the guts of Egyptian mummies. Um, and, then, and then these other ones are a little bit more controversial. Um, and the reason for that is uh, a lot of people don't think DNA can survive this long. Uh, 8 million, 25 million years. Uh, a lot of people think, you know, maybe 50 to 100,000 years is kind of a max that DNA can survive. Uh, but then again, these endospores, they have special chemicals that protect the DNA. So, uh, but there have been scientists that have, have claimed uh, that they were able to revive bacteria from this. Uh, this study here, by the way, this one, uh, this last one, uh, claiming to have um, uh, revived bacteria from, from bees and amber, uh, that was actually part of the inspiration for a little movie you may have heard of called Jurassic Park. And uh, maybe remember in Jurassic Park, the principle behind it was uh, getting dinosaur DNA out of the guts of insects that had bitten these dinosaurs. Um, so, you know, uh, Michael Crichton, he was, he was reading the science and then, you know, turned it into science fiction and that's what he did. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, and, and this is where some people think that they were they able to uh, recover bacterial endospores. Of course, the question is how careful were they and all that, uh, and I think there's still been some debate over it, but it's kind of interesting idea that uh, obviously endospores can last a long time and they're very tough. So let's write a note about endospores. So back to our notes, here we go. Go down, so we have endospores, that's the next one, endospores. So what are endospores made of? So uh, kind of have, well, I'll just say we have DNA, and chemicals wrapped in a thick layer of peptidoglycan. So that's a decent description of endospore. Obviously, they're more complicated than that, but that's kind of uh, the, the gist of it. So what is an endospore doing? So this is a dormant, by dormant, I mean uh, kind of a sleeping structure, um, dormant, tough, structure to preserve the cell until favorable conditions return. So look at that. My spell checker doesn't like my Canadian spelling of favorable. So I'm just going to add that to the dictionary. Okay, so a little bit more room there. I can't remember how I, I we're really close to the end. Um, so let's see what else we have here. Okay, there we go. So a few other things about bacteria that are worth talking about. Uh, and this is gonna be uh, something we're gonna talk about actually next week's lab. Uh, they come in many shapes and sizes. Uh, these are kind of the most common shapes to know. So I, I've used these words already at least once or twice. Um, so the spherical ones are known as the cocci. One is caucus. So staphylococcus. Uh, if they're rod shaped, they're known as bacilli or bacillus. And if they kind of have a twisty shape, they're called a spirillum or a spirilli. So these things can exist uh, in different arrangements. So you could have diplo meaning two. So a diplococcus, you know, would look something like this or the two of them together. Uh, they can be in clusters. So we talked about staphylococcus already. So we're gonna get a chance to uh, take a look at some specimens next week and use these, uh, use these terms. Uh, strepto means a chain. So if you have a streptococcus, so the streptococcus is what gives you strep throat and it will form a little chain under a microscope that looks something like this. So know these for the lab. You might see them on the lab exam. We'll talk about them more next week. So I just want to talk a little bit about some select bacteria for a minute, and mostly E. coli. Uh, but there's many, many groups of them out there. Uh, you can see this is a little chart from the textbook talking about uh, one of the biggest group, which are the, uh, uh, the proteobacteria. So these are all gram negatives, by the way. And uh, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of groups. You can see alpha, beta, gamma, and so on. And, and a whole huge variety of these things. Uh, some of them are pathogens that make us sick. Some of these are photosynthetic, like this one here. These are uh, photosynthetic purple bacteria. You can see they're actually um, making sulfur. 
So plants will make oxygen when they do photosynthesis, but these weird bacteria, they make sulfur instead. So they, they kind of have some cool things going on. Uh, here's some other groups. Uh, you can see the gram positives we've talked about here already. And I mentioned that gram negatives and gram positives aren't the only groups out there. So there's uh, these chlamydias. These cause the sexually transmitted infection chlamydia and uh, spirochetes cyanobacteria. These are photosynthetic, um, actually closely re related to the, uh, the gram negatives as well. So a lot, lots of different groups out there and a huge variety of things that they can do. Let's talk about E. coli for five minutes. And uh, um, I'll tell you a little bit about E. coli because we're certainly going to hear about E. coli. And, you, and if you take any more science classes, you're going to hear all about E. coli. So E. coli is short for Escherichia coli. That was named after Guy Theodore Escherich. And uh, it is found in your bowels. It's found in your, in your intestine. And you can see my note here is it's mostly harmless. Um, there are a few. Uh, that might make you sick, but most of the time it's actually good for you. So I want to talk about the good part of E. coli first. Uh, you know, this is what a lot of people think. They think E. coli, ooh, gross, it's uh, going to make us sick and whatnot. And this is how I want you to think of E. coli, is it's part of us. It's natural. It, uh, and like anything natural, uh, you know, sometimes it can be bad, right? A hammer is good until you hit your thumb. Um, you know, and things like that, right? Cars get us around and, and they're bad when we get into accidents. So E. coli is the same way. Most of the time it's doing us some good. So where is E. coli found? In your intestine, uh, small and large. Uh, and uh, it's, it's actually part of our fecal bacterium. So that means when you poop, um, E. coli comes out along with a lot of other species. And uh, E. coli is actually just a small fraction of the organisms that live in your intestine. Uh, why do we hear about it so much? Partly because it grows really, really well in the lab. Uh, so, you know, um, and so it's easy to study, easy to grow, and so on. And it's very, very common. It's found in all mammals, birds. So it's, uh, it's uh, ubiquitous. That's the word for meaning. It's everywhere. Um, here's a number for you. I know you didn't want to think about this, but uh, think about how many people are on the planet. What are we at? Seven point something billion. And how many bowel movements per day and how many E. coli that represents. Um, it represents about a billion trillion E. coli uh, are emitted from humans on a daily basis. Kind of scary, right? You know, so it is everywhere. So what is it doing there? Um, it's happy there. We're giving it food, we're giving it warmth, we're giving it water. Um, e. coli is very happy in your intestine. And actually we're happy it's there because E. coli is making uh, niacin for us. So niacin, you might know, is one of the B vitamins. And so this is a benefit of having E. coli. And uh, I think some versions of E. coli actually make vitamin K as well. So it's, it's a good thing. It's a good relationship uh, until, until it's not, unfortunately. So there are many strains of E. coli and uh, most of them fit into this category here, non-pathogenic. So this includes a lot of normal E. coli and uh, a lot of uh, lab strains. You can see geneticists, they love giving terrible names to things, DH5-alpha. What, what does that mean? I mean, it's just kind of the way it is, unfortunately. Um, the ones that we hear about in the news fall into this category, pathogenic ones. Um, so uh, just looking at the time here, I'll, I'll talk about the pathogenic ones in a minute. Um, but these are the ones that people might catch when they go to Mexico or someplace where the water maybe isn't treated as well as it should be. Uh, often you're looking at some sort of fecal contamination of that water. It could be animal or human waste. And, uh, and some of these pathogenic ones, uh, usually you're getting diarrhea. Sometimes it's not serious and sometimes it's very serious. Depends on which strain you get. Usually it's the serious ones. This group here actually, EHEC. Nine times out of 10 when we hear what you call in the, movie, in, the, in the news, we're talking about this one strain. So that's unfortunate. Some do fall in the potentially pathogenic category, uh, meaning that they don't usually make us sick. Uh, but once in a while, there's a circumstance where they maybe get into the wrong place. So, for example, if you've ever had a bladder infection, um, well, that was probably E. coli. Uh, it just got into the wrong piping. And, uh, and when it's in the wrong place, it causes discomfort and in some cases, uh, serious disease. So sometimes that happens as well. People have been known to get pneumonia from E. coli. It's really rare, but I don't know how it got in the lungs. But uh, when it does, that's going to make you sick. So that's unfortunate. 
So these, these pathogenic ones, um, like I said, I'm not going to talk about too much more about them other than to say that there are a few nasty strains out there. And that's why we do need to treat our water and uh, why we do need to watch out for uh, making sure that um, these particular strains are not in our food. And uh, that's why there's food recalls once in a while. So I can see we're almost out of time. I'm just going to um, uh, finish off on this slide and just say that E. coli uh, has been very useful for genetics and laboratory studies. Uh, one of the big uses of E. coli, uh, it has a bunch of uses in biotechnology. This is one of the earliest uses, uses of E. coli in biotechnology is to make human insulin. So before 1982, if you had diabetes and if you wanted insulin, they got it from animals. Uh, I think it was sheep. So the sheep didn't like that. They were slaughtering the sheep to get the insulin. Uh, it was super expensive. And it was also sheep insulin. And so some people actually would develop an allergy to it. Um, so it was, was not a good system. Uh, so 1982, people were like, hey, let's, uh, okay, let's take that gene for human insulin and we could put it in a bacterial plasmid. So we were just talking about plasmids. Remember the little loops of DNA? So you can, um, using some enzymes and, and other molecular tools, uh, make something called recombinant DNA. And uh, this is super easy to do nowadays. We have lots of tools. Back in 1982, this was, uh, took them like a year to do it. Uh, and, and then you can, you can put that plasmid back into E. coli. And then what does E. coli do? E. coli reads the gene. It, it, it uses its uh, enzymes and, and ribosomes and it makes human insulin. And so now diabetics can get uh, insulin. We can get it super cheap. And uh, it's not animal insulin, so they're, they're not at risk of getting allergies to it. And, uh, and this is doing a lot of, a lot of great stuff for, for people. Okay, so Monday I'm going to uh, start topic six. I'm probably gonna cover just a little bit of it. Um, and uh, my intention was to finish it, but I'm just about half a lecture behind and I really don't wanna uh, sacrifice any review on Wednesday. I want all of Wednesday to re be review. So on Monday, I will pick a point and decide that's what's going to be covered on the midterm. And then there might be a little material that will uh, spill over to midterm number two. So Friday afternoon, uh, thanks for coming out. And uh, I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, send me some emails if you have any questions while you're studying, and I will answer them uh, uh, when, I, when I get to it. And uh, I will be available next week as well for uh, any questions about the midterm or the lab uh, or anything you might else you might have uh, regarding the course. All right, we'll take care and we'll see you on Monday.